nice to see you here today at ESC TV Conversations in Barcelona 2022. My name is Emma Svenberg. I'm a cardiologist from the Karolinska University Hospital in Stockholm, Sweden. And with me today, we have a very important guest, Professor John Cam from St. George's University in London, UK. A warm welcome. I think Professor Cam is known to most of you as he's been a clin stellar clinical cardiologist for many years, dedicating his life to arrhythmia research, producing more than 400 papers on the topic. So who could be more suitable than Professor Cam to discuss with us today about the unknowns of atrial fibrillation and current knowledge gaps? And I thought we'd jump straight in with early detection of atrial fibrillation. There's been two large screening studies published in the last year, the stroke stop study and the loop study, looking at if we should detect atrial fibrillation early to prevent hard clinical outcomes. One study was slightly positive and the other was neutral. So what is your take? This is still a knowledge gap. What, what, how do you perceive screening? Well, I perceive screening as a very important development in atrial fibrillation. But of course, it surprises most cardiologists that screening has not already been instituted on a more formal basis. The reason for that, of course, is that many of us find atrial fibrillation in patients who present with stroke. And that's the first time that their atrial fibrillation has been discovered. And so screening seems to be imperative. But of course, you can't institute very expensive healthcare priorities without having very good data. And therefore, we need many studies that will together give us information about the value of screening. Can we find atrial fibrillation in sufficient patients, the right patients? Can we then institute therapies that will make a difference? Of course, we're mostly thinking about preventing stroke. But of course, we might also be thinking of not only preventing stroke, but preventing the development of heart failure, perhaps, preventing uh, dementia, perhaps, or even uh, thinking about the need to get on urgently with managing the atrial fibrillation itself. But so far, we don't have enough studies. You mentioned two very important studies that were presented last year, and they had slightly discrepant results, one being just positive and the other being really just negative. And clearly we need larger studies and we need more of them. And I'm pleased to say that many are underway, including the SAFER study, which will have over 100,000 patients. And so I think that will really help tell us whether screening is an important thing that we should be doing. But in the meantime, I would recommend that doctors take every opportunity to find if their patients, particularly the older patients, patients with heart failure, patients who've had a stroke, for example, they should be feeling the pulse, an old habit of doctors to feel the pulse. And if it's irregular, they should certainly be recording an ECG and making a diagnosis if it's there of atrial fibrillation. Yes. I would agree with that and trying to find atrial fibrillation early. Another study focusing on early detection or early treatment of atrial fibrillation was the East AFNA trial. Now in this trial, actually the old adage that we, couldn't, we didn't need to treat asymptomatic atrial fibrillation patients with rhythm control, that was kind of turned over. So it's been a very interesting study from many, uh, from many points of views. How do you see that um, study and that new paradigm? Well, it's very interesting. I should say that when I was a medical student, don't tell anybody, but in the 1960s, atrial fibrillation was regarded as an acceptable alternative to sinus rhythm. So we were allowed to lead patients in atrial fibrillation, not try and do anything about it. But we've gradually appreciated over the decades that atrial fibrillation is associated with so many complications which are very serious. And for that reason, we have begun to think how best to manage it. 
We have ways, of course, of cardioverting atrial fibrillation. We have ways of preventing recurrences of atrial fibrillation with drugs and ablation techniques. So shouldn't we be doing that? Well, we had a large number of trials, six or seven of them two decades ago, that investigated whether we should simply use rate control or rhythm control. And they showed that there was no advantage to rhythm control. Now, the new twist on that is taking patients who've only just been recognized to have atrial fibrillation and treating them early. Now, one trial was designed on that basis. It was called uh, the um, AFNET-4 trial. Uh, and that study showed quite conclusively that an early strategy of rhythm control as opposed to rate control was definitely advantageous. There was a reduced mortality, a reduced stroke rate, both in themselves statistically significant. And then there were numerically reduced hospitalizations for heart failure and acute coronary syndrome. Together, the composite endpoint was highly significant. So that raises the question of whether our policy of starting patients on rate control, seeing if we can abolish symptoms with rate control, and if we cannot consider rhythm control, that policy needs some reconsideration. Now, many would argue we don't have enough data yet to turn our guidelines topsy-turvy. But on the other hand, I think there's enough evidence there for us to think seriously about whether we should not be waiting for refractory symptoms, but we should begin to treat our patients directly and early with a rhythm control policy. Yes. So taking that a little further, I'm thinking about the screening detected atrial fibrillation. Now that's super early, even earlier than the first diagnosed perhaps atrial fibrillation patients. So do you think even these patients might be subject to rhythm control in the future? I think that's a very interesting and challenging question because of course uh, atrial fibrillation, which has been detected by screening, could be atrial fibrillation which only occurs very rarely and doesn't last for very long. And does that really present an important thrombogenic risk? Will it progress to an atrial fibrillation which is more prolonged? Can we interrupt that progression by, for example, using rhythm control at that stage? Well, I think that we don't have any data to support that at the moment, but certainly the combination of early screening and early rhythm control sounds very attractive, and many of us are very eager to see if this will make a major change to patient outcomes. And if it does, we will have a real paradigm shift on how to manage atrial fibrillation. Yes, so that's indeed a knowledge gap. Um, I was thinking, we mainly think about our atrial fibrillation patients in anticoagulate, then think about the better symptom control, the ABC. How about comorbidities? Do you see that, perceive that as important in our patients with atrial fibrillation? Increasingly, we recognize that comorbidities are a real issue, as of course is lifestyle. And, and the C in the ABC of the European guidelines refers not only to comorbidities, cardiovascular risk and lifestyle issues. They're all important and of course we should address them as soon as possible. We should be addressing them before atrial fibrillation ever begins. But if we're presented with a patient who has atrial fibrillation, we must manage the comorbidities and the lifestyle issues rather aggressively in order to try and reduce the triggers for and the substrate development for atrial fibrillation. So the C in the ABC guidelines is really a critical element. And should possibly be even early on in treatment then? Yes, indeed. Uh, of course, we should be treating all of those things before the atrial fibrillation begins, but uh, so often that's not the case.
we don't know them yet at that stage, right? So over the years, we've seen a reduction in ischemic stroke. A lot of it due, I think, to the introduction of novel oral anticoagulants and the better treatment of atrial fibrillation. So what do you perceive as new within the field of oral anticoagulants for patients with atrial fibrillation? Well, I completely agree with you. The introduction of the NOAX or the DOAX direct oral anticoagulants, as they are called, increase the proportion of patients with atrial fibrillation at risk of stroke who are anticoagulated. Prior to that, it, the introduction of these drugs, it was about 50%. It's now 70 to 75 percent in most surveys. Now that is a very major change. But you notice that there's 25 percent who are still not anticoagulated. And only about half of those are even treated with an antithrombotic, such as aspirin. Not that aspirin is particularly effective. It shouldn't be a treatment of choice. But can we do anything about that 25% who are not treated effectively with an anticoagulant? And I think we can, because the reason that that 25% are not treated is largely because of the fear of bleeding. The fear of bleeding mostly on the part of the physician, although some patients come to me and they say, oh, I knew somebody with atrial fibrillation taking these drugs and they had a terrible bleed and I'm not going to take them. So it is a fear shared by patients and physicians. Physicians may choose to give a low dose, often inappropriately low dose of anticoagulant or to omit the anticoagulant altogether. So with that in mind, it's interesting to see that there is a new category of anticoagulants the so-called factor 11A inhibitor. Now this is important because physicians have now appreciated that we can dissect the coagulation pathway into what is called the intrinsic pathway and the extrinsic pathway. And the, these pathways are responsible for clotting on the one hand and hemostasis on the other hand. So what we need to do is interrupt the clotting coagulation pathway, which is the intrinsic pathway, while not inhibiting the extrinsic pathway, which is responsible for hemostasis when we damage blood vessels and so on. Now, these drugs do now exist. They're going through phase two and early phase three studies. It won't be long before we have them. They are being studied in atrial fibrillation. I look forward to seeing the data, but the, the promise is, I think, that they will reduce bleeding by at least half of the rate of bleeding that we see with the novel oral anticoagulants. If that's the case, I think that we'll want to use those drugs. So thank you very much for coming. Lots of knowledge gaps left to address in atrial fibrillation. So hopefully we'll do it again in a few years' time. Thank you. Thank you.